My favorite uh, cold treat is the Kind ice cream bar. I don't know if anybody's had the Kind ice cream bar. It's only 180 calories, which I'm really excited about. And every time I have one, which is every night for the last three weeks, like I just want to call the people of Kind and just say, you guys did a great job. Like This is awesome. Like I'm just proud of them. They worked hard. They put it together. And it's amazing. So you guys should try that out. Today is our final installment of this series we've been in called The Grammar of the Gospel. And in this series, uh, we're simply asking a couple questions. What did Jesus actually accomplish on the cross? What did he achieve on our behalf? And what's unique about this? Because there's plenty of other people who've been crucified, nailed to a cross by Roman soldiers. What is it that makes the death of Jesus so unique and from the Christian worldview so powerful? And what we're seeing as we open up the New Testament is that the New Testament authors didn't just believe that Jesus kind of accomplished only one thing on the cross. It seems that he accomplished more than we could really even imagine. So every week for the last five weeks, we've been looking at these different words or different themes that if you're reading the Bible, you'll come across. Words like redemption. Jesus has come for our freedom. Words like sacrifice. Jesus has come to put away our sin once and for all. Words like reconciliation. Reconciling us to God and then to one another. Words like justification, that one day we're going to stand in the courtroom of God, and because of Jesus and his death, we're going to be declared righteous. And like my biggest prayer as pastor here at New City is that as we reflect on these words, not only for these five weeks, hopefully for like the rest of our lives, we're really awestruck. We're awestruck by the love of God and the power of God displayed on the cross. That's what I want for us, to be awestruck by who God is, what God has done for us, and that we won't look to the cross as this thing that's just happened in the past, this one-time event. We would look to the cross and see its transforming effect and power on our lives today. So today, we're going to look at our final theme. It's the theme of victory. Now, for there to be victory, there has to be an opponent, right? David needed a Goliath. Um, Luke Skywalker needed a Darth Vader. The Golden State Warriors needed the Cleveland Cavaliers three times. And I praise God all three times. But who is God's opponent? Who's God's enemy? And how did Jesus and his death on the cross bring us victory? That's what we're going to be exploring tonight. Here's our first heading for our time together. If you'd like to take notes, maybe you can write it down. Number one is this. The Bible clearly teaches that there is a spiritual enemy. And if you're reading Scripture, this spiritual enemy has a pervasive presence everywhere. He's just there. And it's not like the Bible starts off with this 10-point treaties to our Western mind to help us believe in the spiritual realm, he's just there. He's there in the very beginning, tempting our first parents away from God. Look what it says in Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? From the very beginning, we meet the spiritual enemy, the spiritual adversary that is causing humanity to question the goodness of God, the truth of God, and the love of God. He was just there. He's there at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, tempting Jesus to throw it all away. 
Matthew chapter 4, it says this, Again, the devil took him, that's Jesus, to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. But who is this spiritual enemy? I want to make one thing clear. Hopefully, like this, this sticks with you. This spiritual enemy is not God's equal. This spiritual enemy is not God's cosmic counterpart. From a Christian worldview, we believe before there was anything, there was God. And God is the author of all that we can see and all that we can't see. And we can enjoy the good gifts of creation, but there's this cosmic difference between the created world and the creator. I'm going to Africa in a couple days, really excited about that. Been thinking about giraffe. They got giraffes in Africa, right? And I might just see a giraffe. And a giraffe is really amazing. A giraffe is really beautiful. But we know instinctively that there's no way that a giraffe can somehow level up or evolve and somehow thwart the plans of God. There is this clear distinction, this cosmic difference between creator and creature. And so when we think about the spiritual realm, when we think about this spiritual enemy, he's there, he's working, he's working to cause havoc, but again, he is not God's equal, he is not God's cosmic counterpart. Theologian Greg Allison says this, Though all angels were created upright, one of them, joined by a large number of other good angels, rebelled against God. Puffed up with pride, Satan and his followers overstepped the boundaries with which they were created and for their treason were punished by God. Indeed, God banished them, uh, banished the evil army from heaven and confined them to earth where they oppose God and seek to thwart his work. So this spiritual enemy is a creature created by God, but who has rebelled against God? Now, maybe this is your first time here. Maybe you're just like investigating kind of the truth claims of Christianity. We're so glad you're here. But maybe this spiritual enemy, this serpent, it all sounds just as believable as the Easter Easter bunny and the tooth fairy. And I get it, I get your hesitation. The world we live in questions or causes us to question um, anything that we can't see and touch. It's interesting though, I found this research study that came out by Pew Research in 2023 and it said this, that 81% of Americans say that there is something spiritual beyond the natural world. Most Americans believe in this spiritual realm, and it's interesting, as I engage with people throughout the Bay Area, I've met very few hard-nosed atheists. I've met lots of people who say they're spiritual. Maybe you're here today, and you consider yourself spiritual. And if you consider yourself a spiritual person, you're opening yourself to the spiritual realm. And from the biblical perspective, the spiritual realm is alive and active. And this spiritual enemy that is just there, who has this pervasive presence throughout all of Scripture, I would say this, he is working to push back against all the good that God is wanting to do in this world. He is working to push back against all the good that God is wanting to do in your life. And maybe you've sensed that before. Maybe you would have never identified it as the spiritual enemy but maybe you've gone through seasons of your life where it just felt like you were drifting further and further away from God. Now, some of that might be on me, and some of it might be on you, but again, I think in the background, there is a spiritual enemy that is crafty and working in different ways in different parts of the world and doing everything he can to lure us away from God, to lure us away from God's truth, and to lure us away from God's people. That's what the enemy wants for each and every one of us, that we wouldn't flourish, that we wouldn't experience the joy-filled life in Jesus, but we would move further and further away from God and his purposes 
for our life. I feel like I've met more and more people uh, recently who've identified how challenging the pandemic was. I mean, the, the pandemic was challenging for all of us. And one of the things that was most challenging about the pandemic is that it forced us into isolation, right? We were forced to be in isolation, which, you know, we were trying to look out for others and do the right thing and not spread this virus. But we were never created to be in isolation. But even a couple years post-pandemic, people are still struggling to kind of step out of that isolation. Now, I'm not here blaming the pandemic on the spiritual enemy, but I think the spiritual enemy would do whatever he can to keep us in isolation. Because he wants to do whatever he can by any means necessary that we wouldn't flourish in Christ, but we would move further and further away from God and his purposes. Jesus would say it like this in John chapter 10. He says, the thief comes only to kill or steal, kill, and destroy. That's the target on your head, your destruction. The apostle Peter would also use vivid and descriptive language in 1 Peter 5 eight, he says, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Again, the New Testament authors weren't afraid to talk about the spiritual realm and the reality of how this enemy is working. And we can't blame everything on the enemy. Like, I can't blame my foolishness on the enemy. But I also can't walk through life so naive not understanding that he is a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So in the scriptures, right, there are real warnings about this spiritual enemy. But I want to make it clear, the spiritual enemy is limited in his power and has no real chance in defeating God. He's real. He's like this pesky mosquito, He would love to ruin your night, but he has no real power in defeating God. Even if we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, there's this allusion to the final destruction of the enemy. Genesis 3.15 says this, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. So this is God speaking to the spiritual enemy, the adversary, and he's speaking judgment over him. There's going to be a war between You and the woman, between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Theologians call this the Proto-Evangelion. It's the first gospel pronouncement that one day there's going to be this he, and this he is going to come to destroy and crush the very head of the serpent. And so we're reading the scriptures And we're asking ourselves, who is this he? Who is this son? Who's going to be the one that comes to destroy and crush the head of the serpent? So we no longer are led further and further away from God and his will for our life. So we're no longer kept in the dark, but experience the light and are brought to the joy-filled life. That's point number one. Point number two is this. The enemy is defeated through the death of Jesus. The enemy is defeated through the death of Jesus. Again, we're reading the Bible, and we're trying to figure out who this he is going to be. And as we're reading through the scriptures, we come across some great heroes of the faith. Abraham, Jacob, Moses, right? Rahab, Ruth, David, and Solomon. And these are people that we can learn from, but the closer we get to them, we realize they're just like us. They need a savior. They are not the hero of the story. I don't know if you've ever met your hero. Maybe somebody you looked up to. Maybe somebody you had like their poster on your wall and you finally met them and they, you just left a little disappointed. It's like they didn't live up to the expectations. The closer you got to them, the closer you realize they're just like you. When we look at the great heroes of the faith, again, there's, there's people in the Bible that we can learn from, but oftentimes we're learning from their mistakes. They're just like us. They too need a savior. And then all of a sudden, in an unexpected way, a virgin gives this unglamorous birth 
in a nothing of a town called Bethlehem. She gives birth to a son, to a he. And as this boy continues to grow up, we learn that there is something different about him. Later in his life, he would even have the audacity to say that he was one with and equal to God. He claimed to be God in the flesh. But he didn't just claim to be God in the flesh. He, he backed up his pronouncements by showing his, his divine power through a number of miracles. So we see Jesus, and Jesus turns water into wine. He multiplies loaves and fishes, and he heals the sick. And if we keep reading the story of Jesus, we see that he's not just throwing parties and multiplying wine and food and fish. We also see that a number of his miracles include him demonstrating his divine power over the the spiritual or the demonic realm. And what we come to learn about Jesus is that Jesus didn't just come to show us how to live. Jesus didn't just come to forgive us of our sins. Jesus came to push back against darkness and to defeat the enemy. The author of Hebrews unpacks this with a little bit more theological nuance. You can just follow along with me as I read Hebrews chapter 2. Again, we're thinking about the death of Christ and how the death of Jesus brings us today victory. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 to 18 says this, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Anybody here ever gone through a dark season where you feared and felt like the presence of death? Verse 16, For surely it's not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For the reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and a faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So the enemy wants our destruction. And what does the enemy do? The enemy will work by any means necessary to lead us away from God and lead us towards sin. And as we continue to walk away from God and towards sin, we continue to live under this this judgment of death. But this is why Jesus comes. Jesus comes and lives a perfectly righteous life. Jesus goes to the cross and, and dies in our place for our sins. Three days later, Jesus defeats death and raises in victory. And the reason Jesus does all of that is so that we would no longer be under this this judgment of death, but we would be able to be welcomed in the presence of God and given abundant life. Satan wants to keep us over here, and that's the power he has, is to keep us under this judgment of death, a death that we actually deserve, but God wants to give us grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. Jesus has defeated the enemy and defeated death by providing a pathway so you and I would have life and have it to the full. John 10.10 again says this, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus has come for your freedom no longer living under the judgment of death, but free now to worship God. And nothing frustrates the enemy more when we live and embrace our freedom. But not free to run away from God or free to ignore his word, now free and with great joy to glorify God, serve others, and follow God's righteous path for our lives. That's what Jesus has done on the cross. He's put away your sins. He's reconciled us to the Father. He's justified us in the courtroom of heaven, but he's also defeated the enemy. He's also brought a victory for us so that we could experience all that Christ has for us. Amen? Amen. Number three, living in the victory of the cross. I want us to live in light of this victory 
And when I talk about living in victory, the last thing I want to somehow communicate is that living the Christian life is all of a sudden easy and comfortable. There is nobody in this room that is following Jesus for longer than four hours that would say all of a sudden their life is easy and comfortable. But there is a victory that Jesus has secured for us, and this victory is meant to have profound implications for our everyday lives. I want to talk about some of those implications. Number one, the spiritual enemy is now even more limited in his impact. The cross was a decisive blow. The enemy is limping along. At this point in redemptive history, the enemy is still working, so we have to be on guard. We have to be alert. Again, the enemy wants to wreak havoc in our lives. Over and over, there's these New Testament exhortations. Be on guard. Stay alert. But he has been delivered this decisive blow. And so what I want us to understand, what I want us to make sure that we're, we're living from is this place where we're not granting the spiritual enemy more power in our lives than he actually has. He is there. He's like that pesky little mosquito. But he does not have power over you. If you are here and you've placed your faith in Jesus, you are God's. God is with you. God is for you. And there's nothing that the enemy can do to separate you from the love of God. And so what I want you to know is if you're experiencing a season where um, you may be struggling in your journey with Jesus, like, welcome home, this is a bunch of strugglers, but God is with us, right? And God will do anything in his grace, in his power, and his might to help us make progress, to help us experience breakthrough, to help us grow and mature. The enemy is real. He is working. But let's not give the enemy more power than he actually has in our lives. He is defeated. He is barely limping along. And if we are God's children, God is on our side and God is stronger. Number two, we can now live with biblical courage in the face of death. Ooh, I'm excited about this one because I need this one. We can now live with biblical courage in the face of death. Death is most likely a reality for all of us, but for the Christian, death is simply this uh, doorway into greater communion and joy with God. And since death and the fear of death has been defeated, we now can live with biblical courage even if death is knocking at our door. I want to define biblical courage as this commitment to glorify God, serve others, and advance the gospel no matter what the cost. That's biblical courage. I want to live for God's glory. I want to serve other people, especially those in need. And I want to spread the good news of the gospel. And whatever that may bring, and sometimes that may bring real challenging realities in our life, we can push through that fear. Even if the worst things happens, we still win. Even if death is knocking at our door because we are committed to living with biblical courage, we can press through that fear knowing that our death is not the end of the story. I don't know if you guys heard, but recently there was three Christian missionaries that were killed in Haiti. Haiti's been in just, you know, absolute turmoil for some time now. And I'm thinking about three Christian missionaries there serving the least of these and helping more and more people understand God's love for them. And as the country is kind of unraveling, I'm sure there was fear. But they pressed through that fear, knowing that even death came their way, their death was not the end of the story. Because death has been defeated, Jesus has risen from the grave, right? And the victory that Jesus has secured for us is ours today. So number two, we can now live with biblical courage in the face of death. And number three, we can live with the hope that no one can take away from us. Our world is dark. And this roaring lion, the spiritual enemy, is working to advance darkness. Even if we think about our own city, whether it's political corruption, it's gun violence, it's sex trafficking, um, the world is dark. And sometimes this darkness can rob us of joy. 
But no matter how dark it gets, Jesus has secured for us a future victory, and that future victory fuels us with present hope. Jesus has secured for us a future victory, and that future victory fuels us with present hope today. A hope that says one day we will rise like Jesus. One day the enemy will forever be defeated. One day all things will be made new. This is the hope we have. I think to live in our world, we all need hope, whether you're a Christian or not, right? Where are you placing your hope? Charismatic leaders, politicians, pastors, churches. For the growing Christian, our hope should be in God and God alone. And what we're learning as we gaze upon the cross is that on the cross, the enemy is defeated and we have this future hope that can fuel us in the midst of darkness. So New City, as we wrap up this series, The Grammar of the Gospel, My prayer is that we would see the joy of spending the rest of our lives, the rest of our lives continuing to understand, unpack, and apply Jesus' death and resurrection for our lives. Jesus didn't just accomplish one thing on the cross. The death of Jesus is multifaceted. We just looked at a few things. We looked at redemption. We looked at sacrifice, reconciliation justification, and victory. And all of that is ours. Redemption is mine. Sacrifice, mine. Reconciliation, mine. Justification, mine. Victory, mine. Not because of anything in me, but all because of Jesus. It's all because of his grace and his mercy. So my prayer is that the Spirit of God would be moving in this room and awaken us to a passion for the good news of the gospel. We would love the gospel, we would cherish the gospel, and we would spend our lives finding little ways, small ways, big ways to spread the gospel. And that this good news of Jesus, his death and resurrection wouldn't be in the peripheral, it would be at the very center of our lives, changing us, transforming us, and shaping how we live out our mission to help people find and follow Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We all have this one thing in common, multiple things in common, but one thing in common for sure, that we've all turned away from you. We actually deserve the judgment of death. But you are a gracious God, a merciful God, and you've created a way so that we wouldn't experience death but life. We thank you for the victory that is ours, that we can have confidence today that no matter what this world brings our way, no matter what the enemy brings our way, there is nothing that can separate us from your love. And Heavenly Father, I just pray that as we continue to grow and mature and move forward as a church, that Jesus Christ and the good news of the gospel would be at the very center of this church. It would be because of the gospel that we seek to show hospitality, that we seek to welcome strangers, that we seek to do good works of justice in our community. Help us to not do any of those things outside of Christ, but it would be because of Christ and the good news we have that we would look to love our neighbors just as you loved us. We thank you, Lord, for this day, the opportunity we have just to think and reflect and meditate on your holy word. We ask the Spirit of God would protect this word in our hearts. May it bear fruit and bring about change and transformation in all of our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.